Okay. Well, when we get upstairs, we go better. Yeah, but down here, we're just on a phone. It's just a phone. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it supposed to be about themselves or feeling insecure about who they are. 
Remind them that they are created to be authentic, bringing their whole selves to wherever we are called to be. As they gather, may they trans be transformed by the power of your liberation, knowing that Jesus has come and set them and all of us free. Equip them to be disruptive. Free by the gospel, help them to strive to work for justice and peace. Send them now into the world to be your disciples, agents of your love, hope, and reconciliation. For you have called these women and created them for such a time as this. Amen. May God be with you on your journey, and we pray for your safety, which we know you will have. So we are very proud of you, so thank you.
people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the booths of trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel to the fire. 
For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. God. The second reading is taken from the letter of Paul to Titus. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passion, and in this present age, to live lives that are self controlled upright and godly while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to
what is this? And what does the sheep say? What does the sheep say? <laughs> I thought that was an obvious one. Okay. And this is an angel that sang. And last but by no means least, who is this? The baby Jesus. Okay. So as I'm t as I'm reading this poem, we'll start with Amelia. And you come up here and you place place it in and we'll take turns, okay? So one after another. Got it? All right. We're going to start with the clip clock. Can you do this? Clip clock, clip clock, one little donkey, so fuzzy and gray, to Bethlehem. He is on his way. Clip clock, clip clock. Mary and Joseph, one for each. Mary will ride and Joseph will walk. Both of them are too tired to talk. <laughs> Actually, no. When the road is long, but they cannot stop. Let's clock, let's clock. Now they're there. The fuzzy gray donkey perked up for the ear when Joseph cried, At last we are here! But oh, what a crowd, so noisy and loud. Where would they stay at the end of the day? Do you have room for Joseph said? We've come so far, we need a bed. But the busy innkeeper, he shook his head. Mary and Joseph turned away, but then they heard the innkeeper say, if you don't mind some cows and sheep, I have a place that she can sleep. <laughs> then the shepherds heard a wonderful sound. Angels... Angels, angels, where am I? Angels were singing all around. Glory to God, they sang one and all. Peace on earth, goodwill to all. The angels suddenly went away, and with them went the light of day. Once again, the night was still, and the moon shined on every hill. The shepherds quickly ran with joy to find the baby boy. At last they found where the baby lay, fast asleep and on the hay. Now you know the story so true of how Jesus came to save all of you. Now be like the angels, let your voices sing. Tell all the world about the birth of our King. So don't be afraid. Jesus is always so near. With him by our side, we have nothing. End of that story. So let's pray. Yeah. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to live with us. Thank you for loving us. Place that joy within our hearts. And help us to love everyone else. And all God's people said, Amen. Great job. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Pray with me. Gracious God, we are most delightful to be here this day. Celebrating something that it seems out of place and yet it is never out of place, your birth. We thank you for coming to live among us and we pray that you would place within our hearts your joy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So when you think of Christmas, you probably think of the Christmas story that I just read, the gospel. But is there another passage that comes to your mind? It's kind of iconic. Let me read it to you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Think about that. What has come into being in him was life, 
And the light was the light, light, you hear that word, light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Those are some powerful words, aren't they? Well, I am not crazy. I thought I might get a few laps at this point. <laughs> well, maybe I'm a little crazy. <laughs> but the idea of celebrating Christmas in July is a pretty good idea because we need to be reminded. Just think about it. During December, we hear the words of the Christmas story, but how many of us are busy? You're planning for parties, you're shopping, you're cooking, you're doing all kinds of things. And we're busy. I mean, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> I'm afraid that the whole idea of the birth of our Savior, it's so easy to get lost, isn't it? So we are here today, in the middle of July, literally, to be reminded. We're to be reminded of Christmas and how the boundaries of darkness are pushed back. You may hear me talk a whole lot about Peanuts Gang. Charlie Brown, love me some Charlie Brown. Well, this particular story, Charlie Brown, Linus, and Lucy are lying on a hillside and they're looking up and they can see all of the clouds and just really enjoying the day. And Lucy says, if you use your imagination, you can see lots of things in the cloud formations. What do you see, Linus? And Linus replies, well, those clouds up there to me look like the map of British Honduras. <laughs> The cloud over there looks a little bit like the profile of Thomas Eakins, the famous painter and sculptor. The group of clouds over there gives me the impressions of the stoning of Stephen. And I can see the Apostle Paul standing to one side over there. Lucy responds, uh-huh. That's really good. So what do you see in the clouds, Charlie Brown? And Charlie Brown responds with his typical note of inadequacy. Well, I was going to say a duck, a horse, but I changed my mind. I love Charlie Brown. <laughs> Does Charlie Brown not represent something in all of us? This is the truth. I am so glad he has his own Christmas special. <laughs> it would be the highlight of my Christmas watching that. Charlie Brown, he needed to know that he was loved, and I think we all need to know that we are loved, no matter what. A light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is powerless to overcome it. Darkness has always been a potent metaphor, right? It's for all those things that oppress us, that maybe still enthrall us, frighten us, and intimidate us, causes us worry and anxiety, kind of suck the joy from our lives. We know this darkness. I know we all do. We know the darkness in our physical lives when the illness is close at hand. We know it when we lack the basic necessities of life, food, shelter, and clothing. We know the darkness in our emotional lives when we are burdened with worry or confusion. Fear, grief, guilt, hopelessness. I could go on, right? When we live with violence or addiction or both. We know the darkness in our social lives when relationships fail, when the blessing of solitude gives way to the burden of loneliness, when we cannot make meaningful connection with other people. We know this darkness, let's just be honest, in our spiritual lives, when the chasm that separates us from God remains unbridged from either side, when we know the estrangement from God, which is sin, right? It's the definition of sin, things that separate us from God. When we're separated from other human beings and ourselves, when prayer almost seems like an empty exercise, worship of performance given to an absent audience. Darkness symbolizes the evil with which we are all too familiar because we're human. Well, some years ago, Pastor Mark Radke and his children went caving they were part of a group that explored a cave at the foot of Mount, Mountain Lake, where Dirty Dancing was actually filmed. 
Well, there were three big rooms within this caving excursion, and the leaders led the group, and when they got to the middle room, they stopped and had everyone sit down on the floor. They were to be as quiet as they possibly could, and to turn their headlamps off so there was no light in the room. One by one, they click, 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 clicked off until they were enveloped by a darkness that was impenetrable. Mark said that it was the most profound darkness he had ever been in as an entire life. It made no difference whether your eyes were open or shut. You could not see a thing. You couldn't even see your hand right in front of your face. Well, after a while, the leader turned his headlamp back on. And he says, what a difference that one little six volt little light bulb made in the darkness. It cast enough light to push back the darkness, enable them to see one another. They could see the room they were in, they could see the path of how to get out. While the lights were still out, though, the leader had asked how hard they thought it would be to get out of the cave without any light. Can you imagine? Uh, no. <laughs> the entire group said it would have been impossible. Any attempt would have been futile and dangerous because you couldn't tell the difference between a five foot drop and a 50 foot drop. The leader agreed with them but said, this cave is pretty popular around here. People come every week, sometimes even multiple times a week. So were you to be stuck in this cave without a light, your best bet would be to wait for someone else to enter the cave and find you. Well, it takes no great imagination that cave had and the darkness that we know in our lives. Between the light from the leader's headlamp and the light of Christ, the light of the world, right? We wait for one who enters the darkness, finds us, and brings us out. At Christmas, the boundaries of darkness are pushed back. A light shines in the Bethlehem darkness, and the darkness is powerless to extinguish it. But let's not jump to premature and unwarranted conclusions. A baby is vulnerable, right? A little baby is weak. A little baby is open to attack. So right from the start, we hear from the Luke story that the Christ child is exposed to harm. His mother Mary and her labor was induced by a grueling, ladies, feel it, 80 mile journey on a donkey can't, can't fathom that one, y'all. <laughs> a stable for a birth room, a manger for a bed, harsh hay and straw against that soft skin. And Matthew tells us all about Herod in this murderous rage, ready to kill him at any minute. John's witness is true. The light indeed shines in the darkness, but it's not yet a blinding light. It's a gentle glow. A thing of grace, of tender beauty. It's the first light of the Christ child, God's own son, sent to find us, all of us, who are lost in the night. With no light to find our way. And there are hazards all around us. Ancient tradition called Jesus the day spring. The first ray of God's new dawning day. Other lights must begin to glow before our rescue is complete. How about the candlelight of that last supper on Monday, Thursday? The soldier's torchlight of Good Friday. The glorious brightness of the empty tomb on Easter morning. The Spirit's flame at Pentecost. What we celebrate at Christmas is a birth. It's a beginning. May I say, it's a new day. Is every day not a new day? It's not every day a day that we should remember our baptism and remember who we are. Who are you? Christ child, right? Who are you? Christ child. Who are you? Christ child. Yes, you are. And for today, it is enough. A birth, a beginning, a ray of hope. But more than that, it's assurance that we still know that in the dark corners of our lives, where the fearsome shadows live, 
Emmanuel, God with us, is with us. One of my favorite Christmas hymns is A Little Town of Bethlehem. Anybody else? I love that hymn. It's a hymn that is packed with emotion. It's all about the Christ child, more to Mary, about the creative power of God intervening to history with the gift of the Savior. For me, A Little Town of Bethlehem depicts the Christmas story as the story of hope, where divine and human come together in an amazing, miraculous way. But it's also an invitation for the non-believer as well as the believer. It's an announcement about what God has done for us. What might surprise you is how this hymn came to be. It was written by Philip Brooks, an Episcopal priest. We have some Episcopalians among us. <laughs> Brooks was serving Holy Trinity Church in Philadelphia. He had just returned from a trip to the Holy Land. It inspired him to write this hymn. Brooks was a church organist and Sunday school superintendent's name was Lewis Redner, and he wrote a tune for the upcoming Christmas celebration. Well, Redner procrastinated. He struggled with the creation of this tune. There were five verses, and he was just trying to make it all work. And but it wasn't until the night before the celebration that he finally finished. Is that not typical of these stories? And he created the song that we now know. The following day, 36 children, six Sunday school teachers introduced the song. December 27, 1868. So long it's been around. It wasn't an official hymn in the Episcopal Hymnal until 1892. The following January, Philip Brooks died. He never knew the magnitude of this hymn and how special it was for so many people. Now, for some reason, the fifth Santa has been dropped from the original score. Here are the words. Where children pure and happy pray to the blessed child. Where misery cries out to thee, son of the mother mild. Where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door. The dark night wakes, the glory breaks, and Christmas comes once more. Christ comes to us as a tiny baby. Same flesh and blood, we will celebrate in just a moment during communion. Today we hear his word, the word made flesh, piercing into the silence. Today the boundaries of darkness are pushed back. A light shines in the darkness. A light shines from Bethlehem stable. A light shines from you as we reflect God's love into the world. And the darkness will not overcome it. Amen. Amen.
joining our voice through the heavenly host and Christians throughout time and space. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Christ is born, and your spirit is poured upon us. Renew your church through the gift of baptism. Unite your faithful people across distance and denomination. Teach us to live by your grace. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You reveal your presence over the heights of the mountains, through the cloud and the lightning, and beyond the trembling earth. Still the storms that threaten the land and send relief to all places and peoples experiencing natural disasters, extreme temperatures, or famine. Merciful God, you sent your Son as Prince of Peace, who taught us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Calm the rancor and resentments that divide us. Turn us from worldly passion and violence. May our spirit make us self-controlled, upright and sober, and zealous for good deeds. Merciful God, this is our prayer. Let the ends of the earth know the promise of your reconciliation and renewal. Make beautiful the work of peacemakers community organizers, and advocates who work to ensure that all people flourish in safety and dignity. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, be our comfort and our redemption. Seek out all who feel forsaken or forlorn, those suffering from depression or addiction issues. Bring your healing are on our community tree. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Following the example of Mary and Joseph, let all our families, whatever their size or shape, reflect your holy and life-giving love. Bless adoptive families, foster families, and guardians. Hold in mercy all who are childless, by choice or by life circumstance. Merciful God, as you have guarded the lives of the saints, so shield us from evil and danger. Teach us by their example to serve you with joy and honesty of heart, that we may live as heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Merciful God, our prayer. Abide with us, O God of mercy, and receive our prayers according to your abundant grace. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Let us share that peace with one another. Thank you. 
our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, we may be drawn to love the God who we cannot see. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Oh. 
pray. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but I only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forevermore. Amen.
Yeah, yeah, it's, it's your eyes.